Welcome to Agent of Wealth Podcast with Mark Bowdis from Bowdis Financial. In this podcast, Mark helps small business owners and retirees overcome the multiple wealth planning challenges involved in your financial life. We do this by creating comprehensive wealth management plans to guide you towards financial freedom, ensure you never run out of money, and help create a balance in life that prioritizes what is most important to you. Join us for this journey as Mark draws from years of expertise and guest experts to solve the multiple wealth planning issues involved in your financial life. Hello and welcome to the Agent of Wealth with Mark Boutis of Boutis Financial. Today, Mark has brought in a special guest, and that is Dave Facone. Good morning, gentlemen. How are you? Good morning, Eric. How are you? Good morning. Doing outstanding. I'm I'm uh, I'm excited today because you're talking about reverse mortgages, and I before the podcast we were talking a little bit. One of my family members they utilized a reverse mortgage to help them out, and it went very very well. Uh, it was a little scary at first because we didn't know a lot about it, so we did a ton of research. And uh, it was it was really really good for his situation. So I'm really excited to learn more about what you guys are going to be talking about today. So I'm just going to hand it over and 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 be a pupil. You guys are the teachers. <laughs> okay. So yeah, let's let's get started today. We're going to talk with Dave Facone. Dave's a mortgage lender from Finance of America. And Dave, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Mark. And uh, I also got a. Um, Eric, we didn't talk about this, but I've known Dave for many years. We actually played on the same Babe Ruth baseball team. Uh, I grew up in the same town. So what age is that? Babe Ruth baseball. So uh, I think it was... You, 13? 13, yeah. 13 nice. to 15. Yeah. Right on. <laughs> so we have Dave Dave on the show. We're going to talk about reverse mortgages, and it's a topic I've wanted to talk um, or discuss on here for a while. I'm seeing more and more during retirement income planning where retirees are falling short of uh, you know projecting on not running out of money. Uh, less people have pensions. They may not have enough saved in a 401k or their IRA. Uh, they do things like overestimate how much they'll receive in Social Security or underestimate how much they'll have to pay for things like taxes. But then we go through, you know, we'll look at all the, all the different assets and the liabilities, and we see that they have a ton of equity or a lot of equity often built up in their house. And utilizing reverse mortgage is one way to access that equity, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So, Dave, if we can get started, maybe just give an overview of what a reverse mortgage is. Sure, absolutely. And uh, during the podcast today, you'll probably hear me compare reverse to traditional mortgages a lot because that's what most people are familiar with. So, in the simplest terms, a reverse mortgage is a loan that is secured by a home but the payment is deferred is excuse me deferred to a later date so unlike a traditional mortgage where you you close the loan you move into the home and you are making a customary monthly payments that reduces the loan amount with a reverse mortgage you don't have to make those monthly payments you just have to pay the loan off sometime in the future uh, the reason for the word re- reverse being used is really two reasons so first and foremost the the money flows in reverse so if you utilize the equity in your home you have the choice of taking an initial lump sum payment at closing or initial monthly payments and in this case the cash is coming from the equity in the house and it's going right into your pocket which is reverse from a traditional mortgage where typically monthly you're sending payments to the lender to pay off your balance the the second reason for the word reverse being used is that the loan balance goes in reverse as well so unlike again with the traditional mortgage making monthly payments and the loan balance decreasing month to month with the reverse mortgage you don't have any obligation to make a payment so the loan balance actually increases over time okay so what where where do you see people using you know we i i guess in the intro I talked a little bit about that you know retirement income but where, where do you see people or the, what are the most common uses of reverse mortgages Great question. So first and foremost, the, co- the the biggest common misconception about a reverse mortgage is that the homeowner is desperate, that they need money, uh, they have an immediate need, they don't have cash in the bank, they don't have investments that they can cash out or liquidate. Um, and and that's, that, that, that could be true, but it, it's not altogether true because there are, are other common uses of the reverse mortgage uh, product. So you could have an, uh, an immediate need for cash, like I said. Let's say you need repairs done to your home, or you have maybe medical expenses that were unforeseen. You could use the, the equity from your home in a reverse mortgage loan to cover those expenses. Or some people choose to use the reverse for 
to enhance their lifestyle. So, you know, maybe they aren't cash poor, but maybe they just want to, you know, travel more, or maybe they want to put an addition on their house that they've been postponing for a while, or, you know, they want to make a, a large purchase like a new car or a boat or something like that. It's another good reason or a good use to, to get the reverse mortgage. Finally, um, as you would know, Mark, uh, it could be part of uh, a person's financial plan. So uh, there could be tax benefits to using equity from your home as opposed to using other retirement savings or retirement income. Or uh, part of the financial plan can simply be an emergency fund or a rainy day fund. You can originate the reverse mortgage and you don't necessarily have to draw on it until you need it. Yeah, and I think that that last part about the financial plan, uh, you know, we, when helping someone put a financial plan together. You know, it used to be where we would never really kind of consider the primary residence as an asset as part of the plan because we would always say, well, you need somewhere to live. And so the option was, yes, we can can make it part of the plan, but the the scenario would be they would have to downsize, sell the house, move somewhere else, and, you know, to theoretically pocket the difference and use that as part to, to build their paycheck. But if you incorporate a, a reverse mortgage into the plan, they can kind of get the best of both. They can tap the equity as well as stay in the house. So not everyone wants to move, wants to downsize for different reasons. And, you know, like you said, the reverse mortgage is a way that, you know, they can get access to that equity, uh, have a part of the financial plan and still stay in the house. Um, okay, so on to the next question that I usually get with with reverse mortgages, people want to know, well, what, how, how are they eligible or what, what are the eligibility requirements for being able to utilize a reverse mortgage? Definitely. So uh, pretty simple eligibility requirements, actually. So uh, age is probably the biggest factor and the, the first factor that lenders look at when determining uh, eligibility. So uh, typically, a borrower has to be uh, at least 62 years of age, and lenders do uh, round your age. So in other words, if you are 61 in seven months, we will round up to 62, so you could be qualified. And if uh, we do allow more than one borrower on the application for a reverse mortgage, so if it is a husband and wife situation, then uh, we would need the youngest borrower to be at least 62 years old. Um, there are some caveats where you know, possibly we could reduce the the equity available in the reverse uh, mortgage if you have a, a, a spouse who is below 62. We would cl clarify them as a what we call a non-borrowing spouse. So even though they exist, they may not be on the application. Uh, don't need to go into detail about that right now, but just to, just so the listeners know, um, 62 is really the hot button. If you're 62 or above, then you do have uh, eligibility to get your equity in the reverse. A uh, second qualification or, or necessary uh, guideline for eligibility is occupancy. So uh, reverse mortgages are only uh, lent on homes that you occupy. So if you own an investment property or you own a second home, vacation home, those properties unfortunately will not qualify for the reverse mortgage. It has to be a home that you live in. Um, and property type is also a consideration, although you're not really pigeonholed too much because Reverse mortgages are allowed on any single family property. They are allowed on two to four unit properties that, again, have to be occupied by the borrower. So you can live in a multi unit property uh, as long as it's four units or less and still qualify. Um, you can live in a condominium. You can live in a townhouse. You could even, even live in a modular home or a manufactured home in some cases. And finally, uh, the, the last piece that I want to discuss regarding eligibility. This isn't a requirement per se, but if you have a large amount of equity in the in the property, it definitely helps because then you can have access you know, to the most the most funds that you're looking for. Okay. And let's say assuming someone gets, you know, takes out a reverse mortgage, uh, what what happens they're not there's some obligations that that are involved with it. It's not just okay, we're gonna take it out and and that's it. It's over. What what's part of that that process or those obligations on, in terms of getting it? Great question, Mark. So there are actually a couple of obligations that are required when you do originate a reverse mortgage. Uh, the first of the obligations are right at closing. So when you do close the the reverse mortgage loan, you're obligated to pay any underlying traditional mortgages that may be that may exist on the property already. Um, there is a, a title search involved in closing a reverse mortgage, just like in a traditional mortgage. So 
if uh, the title search discovers any liens or any judgments that are on title, those would also be have to also have to be paid at closing as well. Um, there are a certain amount of closing costs that are paid at closing, of course, um, and initial mortgage insurance premium. So reverse mortgages come not only with an initial mortgage insurance premium at closing, but there's also uh, annual mortgage insurance, which you know accumulates on the balance if uh, if you don't make any monthly payments. Uh, and then once you close on the loan, you're obligated basically to treat the home you know like you've done in the past if you had a traditional mortgage or if you own the home for cash you know traditional obligations are paying your property taxes quarterly typically uh, paying your homeowner's insurance premiums if you live in a flood zone then you may have to pay flood insurance if you are in a condominium or townhouse for instance you're still obligated to pay your homeowner's association fees any maintenance fees that that may occur uh, and the other one of the biggest obligations that really isn't a financial obligation is to continue to occupy the property. So, um, like I said earlier, one of the, the guidelines for approval is this has to be your primary residence. So, once a year, you'll receive a, a document uh, attesting to the fact that you do, in fact, still occupy the property, and uh, that'll be sent back to the lender just to you know just to confirm that it is still your primary residence. Um, the other thing that I that I failed to mention actually at closing. There could be some obligations to pay property taxes or homeowners insurance premiums either at closing or sometimes within the first year of closing. So we actually may put aside some funds after closing to pay taxes or homeowners insurance on your behalf as well. Okay. So I, I think we wanted to talk a little bit now about some of the features of uh, the reverse mortgage because I think it's it's one of the most misunderstood you know financial products that I've have come across. Um, so the first one I wanted to start with was uh, the fact that it's a non-recourse loan. So can you talk a little bit about what happens if the, for example, the the mortgage debt accrues beyond the home value? Uh, you know, one concern I get from people is, well, will my my heirs be responsible for the or get a bill or be responsible for it? So if you can talk a little bit about the non-recourse aspect of it. Sure, absolutely. So uh, non-recourse basically means that. The home is responsible for paying off the debt. The homeowner or the heirs of the homeowner are not responsible. So, uh, so to that end, non-recourse means that no one will ever owe more than the the property is valued at. So, depending on how long you've had the reverse mortgage, how many years fees have accumulated in terms of mortgage insurance premiums, uh, interest interest that gets accumulated over time. Uh, also, it depends on appreciation or depreciation of the property. So if you ever get to the point where the reverse mortgage balance exceeds the value of the property, then that's where the mortgage insurance that you've paid at closing and over time comes into play. So if the homeowner decides that they no longer want to reside there, they want to move to a different property, and they sell the property, the mortgage insurance kicks in, they'll never be responsible for more than 95% of the value of the property at any given time. The mortgage insurance would, would pick up the rest. So no one's no one's walking away from the property, either the homeowner or their heirs, uh, selling it and being stuck with a bill. It just won't happen. Okay. So that kind of gives the homeowner some peace of mind that, like you said, there no one's going to be stuck with a bill. Um, when, it, when it gets when it gets sold. Uh, so the next the next topic I wanted to, to or a question to go over, uh, and this helps me out on the planning side. But how how is the, that principal limit calculated? How can someone know what they're looking at or what potentially they could they could uh, receive from a reverse mortgage? Sure, great, good question, Mark. So uh, the principal limit is calculated based on really two factors. It's based on the age of the borrower, and it's also based on expected interest rates going forward into the future. So there there are charts that exist for through FHA where it will show through HUD where it'll show you uh, exactly what these these ratios are. So you can literally look at you know your age if you're 62 years old and you just begin to qualify for the reverse mortgage and then you can go across the chart see what today's prevailing interest rate is. That'll give you a percentage. Um, I don't have that chart in front of me, but you know let's just say that percentage was was 50 percent. That means that after an appraisal, we can see what the value of the property is. 
and the reverse mortgage uh, would allow you to borrow up to 50% of the value of the home. And again, that number is based on the age of the borrowers, uh, the age of the youngest borrower, again, if there's more than one, and uh, expected interest rates going forward into the future. So you can almost look at it, I guess, compare it to something like Social Security, pension, annuity, where the longer you wait to to collect, or in, in this in this case, take out a reverse mortgage, the more you'd be able to to uh, or the bigger limit or bigger balance you'd be able to to take from it. So it's somewhat of a comparison to to those items. Um, what are the so now? Let's say someone does go forward. They they uh, they want to move forward with the reverse mortgage. What what options or what payout options do they have in terms of accessing that that cash or that's available to them? So there's really two main payout options. So again, comparing it to a traditional mortgage, when you know when you go to purchase a home with a traditional mortgage, the two main options are you can choose a fixed rate or you can choose an adjustable rate. And a reverse mortgage loan is no different. Uh, if you decide that you want the peace of mind of a fixed rate, then that's what you can choose. The rate will never change over time. Uh, the caveat to that is you receive one lump sum payment. So after closing, you know, we determine what the limit is that you can borrow. You determine, uh, you tell the lender exactly how much you want to walk away from at closing within that limit. And then you receive one lump sum payment. Uh, the loan balance begins after closing and starts to accumulate your interest and, and uh, mortgage insurance over time. However, the interest that accrues will never change. The, the second payment option is an adjustable rate where the rate could actually change either monthly or annually, depending on uh, the product and term you choose. And you have the option of getting an initial disbursement after closing with the adjustable rate. And then you also have an open line of credit that goes forward. So that continues into the future. So if you decide you want the initial disbursement at closing, great. If you have some uh, some remaining limit in the future and you want to you know, withdraw from that going forward, you always have that option. And the, the rates could change either monthly or annu- annually, whichever you choose. So if we go back to the, to the options, lump sum, Mainly someone has some need for a big, maybe it's a big medical bill or some debt that they have to, to pay off. Um, and that would be the reason. Otherwise, they're, they're paying, you know, that interest is, is starting from, from day one on that big lump sum. The line of credit, is it more you can compare it to kind of a credit card or a home equity line where they need it, they need it, they use it, they only pay on what they, what they use? Absolutely. And as long as you retain uh, some sort of outstanding balance, even as low as $100 balance in the line of credit, then, uh, then that remains open. So you're absolutely right. You're only going to be charged the interest on whatever you withdraw on, on the adjustable rate. And, and just to be clear, uh, even though I said that there are no required monthly payments, reverse mortgages do allow you to make payments if you want to. So uh, whether it be the fixed rate option or the adjustable rate option, if you have extra cash and it fits into your financial plan, you can always send in payments. And those payments, uh, first and foremost, go to pay off the uh, the mortgage insurance premiums, then interest fees. And finally, you know, when all the fees are paid, then whatever's remaining from that uh, payment that you send will go to, in fact, reduce the principal balance. So you can you could think of the adjustable rate option similar to a traditional line of credit where you actually can use it and pay it uh, as long as you like. Okay. And what happens to the, the home after death? So after death, let's back up just a, just a quick second because the reverse mortgage becomes due and payable when the last borrower no longer occupies the home. And of course, uh, that could be caused by the last uh, borrower's death, of course. So if, if they decide to move out or if they pass away, then the heirs have a decision to make. So th- there's really two, two, two decisions in the thought process. First and foremost, do the heirs want to keep the property? Uh, if they want to keep the property and there's equity in the home, then the heirs can choose to refinance and, and keep it in their own name. Um, if they, they are less than 62 years of age, then they would have to refi with a traditional mortgage. If they are 62 or older, then they could potentially refinance into their own name with their own reverse mortgage. Um, if they want to keep it and there is no equity in the home, meaning the, the reverse mortgage balance has now exceeded the value, then because of the non-recourse feature, like we discussed, the heirs would have to pay off 95% of the home's value, and then they would keep the property. Uh, if there 
if the heirs didn't want to keep the property at all, there's also two options. So again, the first option, if there's equity in the home, they could simply sell it like they would any other home and pay off the, the loan balance that's outstanding on the reverse mortgage. So if they owed a balance of 100000 the house sells for 200000 the heirs would walk away with an extra 100000 in their pocket. Uh, if there was no equity and the heirs did not want to keep the property, then they would simply sign over a deed in lieu of foreclosure, which means they're just essentially handing the ownership of the property back to the lender and the lender will do with it as they please. So it really comes down to, I guess, to summarize two two things. One is, is there equity left in it? And two, do they want to keep the home? And based off of that, the combination of those, you know, the answers to those two questions, that, that would dictate what their options are. On Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, can you go over the, what the, I know the, what the process is of obtaining a reverse mortgage? Sure. So in, in order to obtain a reverse mortgage, the first thing you need to do is have a discussion with uh, a lender like myself. So in that discussion, we will review the options uh, that we discussed previously here on the podcast. So we'll talk about, you know, how old are you and, you know, what do the mortgage rates look like today? What type of limit can you qualify for? Um, how long are you planning on living in the property? Um, all, all the things to see if it actually meets your immediate need, whether you need cash now or you're just planning your financial future with someone like Mark, we would have an initial discussion with a lender like myself and we would determine that. Uh, if you decided that it could be right for you, then, then the lender would provide you with what we call a pre-counseling package. And in that package, you'll get a list of, of loan counselors that are in your area. A reverse mortgage requires that the borrowers do uh, speak to a loan counselor, and they basically are a, a second opinion or, or double-check the fact that the decision that you're making is correct. So, so you do make a, a valid, informed decision. Um, we'll also provide you with initial disclosures, just like you would with any other traditional mortgage. And uh, if you decide that after counseling that the reverse mortgage could be right for you, then we complete a loan application similar to a traditional mortgage, order an appraisal to see what the value of the property is, process the loan, underwrite the loan, uh, close the loan, and then service it just like we would with any other mortgage where you, know, you will get uh, regular regular monthly statements that show you what the loan balance is. If it's a fixed rate, obviously that'll the uh, rate will never change. But if it's adjustable, then you may be more uh, inclined to look at that statement to see if the rates are going up and down month to month or year to year. And uh, and we would be there for you going forward if you ever decide to make another you know, another change on that option on that uh, reverse mortgage or you know or sell the property in the future. We would help you with whatever you need. Okay, so I know with with most, or if not all, financial products, there's pros and cons. There's reasons to to use it, reasons not to use it. What are the, some of the reasons why someone a reverse mortgage may not be a good fit for someone? So, the first reason why it may not be a good fit is if the uh, the plan for occupancy of the home um, is either uncertain or if they have a plan to to leave the home in the near future. So. There are closing fees involved in, in originating the loan in the first place. So, if if you if you use the reverse mortgage as a loan long term financial solution or a rainy day fund, for instance, then spreading out those costs over time becomes very cost effective and, and the benefit becomes much greater. If, 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 on the other hand, you originated the loan, you accumulated the closing fees, and in a short amount of time, you know, a year, two years, for instance, you decide that the home is no longer right for you, well, now the the cost per year to originate that loan becomes much higher and, and the benefit is, is greatly reduced. That, that's the first reason why, why you shouldn't do it if you think you're going to leave the home anytime soon. Uh, secondly, um, and this may seem obvious, but um, you shouldn't you shouldn't originate a reverse mortgage if there's no no tangible benefit to you. So let's say that you qualified for one, but you didn't have a heck of a lot of equity in the house and you wanted to use it for an emergency fund going forward. Well, if your equity is low and you know the limit that you can qualify for is is not a heck of a lot of money, um, why would you pay the cost involved in doing that? It just wouldn't make sense. 
thirdly, also might be a little obvious, if you don't understand how it works. Uh, I think you know we're here today in the podcast to educate Mark's clients and our audience so they maybe get a better understanding of the options they have with the reverse mortgages. But if you're someone who you know is signing on the dotted line, but you really don't know what you're getting into, then uh, that's probably not a, not a good decision for you. And you should you know, go back to your lender, go back to your counselor until you really get a, a grasp of, of what the, the loan entails. Um, Finally, the last reason why it may not be a good idea is if your desire uh, for your home's equity or value is to protect the legacy of your family or the inheritance to your heirs. If you simply don't want to touch the equity in your home and you want to leave an asset uh, for your family after you're no longer with us, then uh, you may want to consider other options as well. Okay, so obviously reasons why it may not be a good option, but there are a lot of of uh, reasons why it may make sense. And like, you know, a lot of things, this is just another tool that as, as a planner, we can use to, to help, you know, help someone achieve their, their goals in retirement or help achieve their, their estate planning goals. So, so we are just about out of time. Uh, So Dave, thank you for being on the show today. How best can someone reach you if they want to get a hold of you? Thanks for having me today, Mark. I really enjoyed myself. Um, You can reach me uh, directly on my cell phone. My phone number is 201 three three four seven zero six seven or you can always send me an email at david d a v i d dot facone spelled f like frank a c c o n e at financeofamerica.com or you can visit my website which is www.davidfacone.com guys thank you so much this was a fantastic podcast david you are a great guest. I learned a ton more than I than I knew from before or that I didn't know before. I learned a lot more today. And obviously, you've been in this business for a very long time, and that's exactly why Mark brought you on. And I'd like to hear some more stories from Babe Ruth Baseball, but uh, that'll be for another <laughs> podcast, right? Yeah, I'll have right. to bring him back. Yeah, all right. Sounds, sounds good to me. All right. Thanks again, guys. And thank you all for listening to the Agent of Wealth podcast with Mark Bautis. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when Mark comes out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. Again, this makes it so much easier to share these podcasts with your friends and family. And this may be something that somebody needs to hear right now. Um, There's all sorts of reasons to do it, just like David explained. Uh, But maybe somebody needs a little help with it. This is a great one to share so they can get in contact with them. Again, thanks for listening today. For everyone at Bautis Financial, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Agent of Wealth podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Boutis Financial. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment and financial planning. 